All right, it's looking like 1.30 right now. Uh, so we can go ahead and get this interest group started off. Um, just as a disclaimer, we'd like to thank our sponsors for this conference and for the presentation. So uh, Emerald Data, which will be doing captioning, though they are sponsoring captioning, there will not be captioning available for the interest groups. And of course, Equinox, who is our platform sponsor and champion sponsor, Mobius. Uh, if you do want to be part of the conversation, I could let you in. I just want you to be aware that there is, I think, a limit of 10 people on uh, this particular session. So you may have to leave if necessary. Uh, but go ahead, Chris. You can take it away when, when you can. Thank you, Gina. And thank you to our sponsors. Um, so uh, this is the, gosh, how many conferences has it been? Like 13 or something. Anyway, we have um, we have had a system administration interest group at every one that I remember since 2010 or so, um, which I think was the second conference. So we're um, th this is typically a very free form conversation. Uh, I've put a link to the Google Doc that you see on the screen uh, at the very top. Um, and if, if you have trouble getting to that, just let me know in the chat. Um, but um, this is where we'll sort of have a scratch pad and uh, record of our meeting today. And um, it, it is, like I said, a free form discussion of system administration topics uh, that can range from local system administration uh, all the way to server administration and even, you know, maybe Linux administration, hardware administration, uh, you know, we've, we've run the gamut of all uh, tech topics in this group before. Uh, on that note, I will mention that um, just as a point of interest that the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia, which is our parent agency, just did a cybersecurity exercise where they attempted to hack into all of our servers. Uh, that included our web servers and um, evergreen servers, uh, test and production. Um, and we, I, I'm glad to say, passed, uh, you know, the way we administer Evergreen is probably in line with the way most people do, but um, I was glad to see that our sort of, uh, we don't do a lot different as far as stock Evergreen goes. Um, they were using a lot of automated tools. Um, we explicitly asked them not to, um, like they didn't know, this was a blind test as opposed to someone who knows what Evergreen's doing and uh, wants to you know, actively exploit what they know Evergreen does. Um, but I was glad to see that sort of the, the anything from script, script kitty style hacks to uh, more determined, you know, uh, brute force attempts and things like that were um, were deflected by our setups. So um, anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions about that if people are curious. I, the, the report that they've given us is not shareable. I can't, I can't uh, share that, but I can answer any questions anybody has. Um, and we may do a follow-up with an app-specific attempt to educate them on how Evergreen works and then, um, you know, tell them to go for it. So anyway, um, so I'm going to open the floor to suggested topics. Any questions? Uh, any um, any th any things from your uh, organizations that you would want to share, like I just did? Um, and I'll just I'll leave it to you, and um, just uh, we can put it in the notes, and we'll have a record of our discussion. Thank you. Was any of that uh, not just break-in attempts, but more along the lines of a denial of service? Yes. Kind of scrape stuff? Yes. Yeah, that, that did include denial of service attacks. Um, and really, our kind of stock fail-to-ban kind of setup worked really well against that. Like, you know, they would try and try and try, and then they would get banned. Um, so that that was that was nice to see that our um, you know we've 
we've been around a while, so we we moved the fail to ban rules from server to server. Um, but yeah, I mean, it their attempts to get into Nginx and Apache and stuff like that were deflected. Yeah, what I tend to see is stuff a lot that's not that. that the effect is denial of service, but more crawlers, not yes following um, directives. Yes, yes, we we've seen the same thing. Um, most of those crawlers do respect robots.txt, um, so you know we usually we can just put you know sim rush bot or whatever in the to the you know robots.txt file and tell them to go away and and they do usually Let's see can you I, share that with folks i seem to get it from turn it in <clears throat> to the extent where they don't seem to honor any directives anywhere <laughs> oh, and okay. um a, a combination of you know straight up blocking their IPs and and also some some things in Nginx looking for stuff from them and turning them away. Right. So let's I'm just gonna record some of what we're talking about. Colors are problem. Denial of service. Um, so Jeff is asking, can, if I can't share, share the report, can you share the aspects of your setup that you feel helped? What do you have failed to ban monitoring, evergreen user login, attempt, login attempts, anything else? Um, we, we don't have failed to ban working on evergreen login attempts. So that, that was not tested. Um, again, I, I think, I think they're, they knew we had, they were on the outside blind attack. They used um, their tools to figure out what they could see running on each server, find out as much as they could about each server, and then try to exploit every vulnerability it knew, they knew about for those sorts of services. So, um, you know, they did not, well, I, we we know that um, you know bad searches or you know attempts at uh, SQL injection sort of stuff can also you know slow down or, or you know fill up the database RAM is what we've seen it do. Um, but um, I don't know if I'm answering your question well, Jeff. Uh, and then for fail to ban. Um, the parts that, like, really the, the most effective were the SSH attacks. Uh, failed to ban, just close those down immediately. Uh, you know, and let's see. Yeah, it was mainly SSH. Um, yeah, okay. Anything else we need to note from what I just was, was talking about? We've talked about um, evergreen administration specifically. If you click on that meeting notes link, you'll see what we used. We've talked about in the past. If somebody wants to follow up from a previous uh, previous session, and as Gina says, just click on "Ask to Share Audio and Video" and um, join the conversation that way. Hey, there's Blake. Okay, so so Blake is using sort of an orchestration technique of um, monitoring um, for configured number of uh, process IDs for Apache Nginx and OpenSurf, 
uh, when it reaches a certain threshold, they'll just blow the brick away and, and put a new one in place. So that that's a nice that's a nice situation. We're not we're not that sophisticated. <laughs> our 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 bricks are pretty permanent. They're not quite ephemeral like that. Now, Blake, are, are you using um, containers for that? And you just blow the container away, or is it a full VM that you replace, or, or what? Oh, okay. Yeah, hop, hop in makes you hop out sometimes. Is it working? Yep. Cool. Yeah. Um, it depends. Uh, we have several different variations of this, but basically the idea is the same where at the bottom of the Docker <clears throat> execution, wherever green brick gets in place, which is a Ansible script, basically, um, there is a custom Perl script that runs at the end that keeps the machine up and running. And then that Perl script goes to sleep every so often, wakes up at random intervals, and does like a check against the number of patchy processes, the number of Nginx they configure. And so if it goes over, say, since we use an Nginx reverse proxy, we've noticed that Apache processes have gone dramatically down. It used to be like hundreds of Apache processes that would spin up on an active production machine. But with Nginx in front, Apache has gone down to like 20 or less. <clears throat> like 15 would be a pretty healthy brick. And so we've noticed over time that a brick that has a really high Apache number is sort of an, is starting to become an unhealthy and unstable brick. And so we have a soft threshold and a hard threshold. So if if it goes over, say, I think it's 30, uh, patchy pids that starts a clock and if it stays at 30 or over 30 for more than another configured amount of time I think it's 10 minutes if it stays up over 30 Apache pits for 10 minutes it'll just kill itself <clears throat> and then that brick dies off and then there's another thing that checks to see how many bricks we have if it's less than the number we need then it makes another one so it automatically kills itself and then the other thing, we'll see that it's not there, and it'll make another one to fill its spot. It takes about five minutes for a new brick to come up automatically like that. So in that five minutes, we'll be at one less brick. So if it's a six brick situation, we'll be at five. So you want to design your uh, production situation so that you could sustain one or maybe even two deaths and still be a, a healthy um, response time for your staff so like <clears throat> you want to plan for it the worst case and it always happens when it's the most busy so at like one o'clock in the afternoon when everybody's really hot and heavy on the servers <clears throat> it'll always you know there'll be one that dies almost certainly and so you want to make sure you have enough bricks to um, sustain that and still sustain the peak load even with one brick less so six bricks is really five bricks or even four, you know, each one being with say eight CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. That would be a total of 48 CPUs for the whole fleet. And you could go down to 40 CPUs and still sustain a high load like that. Um, we've tweaked Nginx 
to sustain a DDoS, which I think is EBSCO. There's some vendor out there that just, that just loves the slash extra slash AC slash on API URL. And do you I'll, have do you have live updates for their EDS thing? I don't know. I don't know what all the libraries have subscribed to in any you know in some of the bigger consortiums, but yeah, that that could, that could be it. We 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 opted against that like sort of preemptively um, where they wouldn't be hammering us all day long trying to update. Yeah. Um, they have no that's throttle. That's what it sounds like. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. They, so they'll bring the whole consortium down because it's basically a CPU race. If they have enough CPUs, say they have 100 CPUs and we have 48 CPUs, they'll hit us with 100 threads and our 48 CPUs will be less than 100. And so we'll run out of CPU before they do. <laughs> and they just, then they just take us down. So so there's a clever um, uh, engine. Nginx gives us a lot of great uh, uh, flexibility in terms of like certain URLs you can pay attention to and then limit the number of hosts that can take that can have a um, read to that so we set it to 10 requests per second per host and if they say in one second they ask for 11 requests it doesn't just kill the 11th one it puts it into a delayed state where it'll wait to respond until the next second mm -hmm. and so if, let's say they did 11 on the first second and then on the second second they also did 11 requests now they have a delayed one from the first second, so it'll respond to that one and then only do nine of the second second, and then there'll be two delayed queued up. And it'll keep doing that until it'll run out of, there's another threshold for the number of things that you can have queued up and delay before it starts getting in 404s. So it's sort of soft. If they really start spiking up, Nginx has a lot of settings that you can change to to try to let them do it for a little while <laughs> until you, and that that really, that basically, took this whole problem out 100%. So uh, nice. the next, yeah. Are, are your configurations um, in a shareable place? Or do well, you, I, do you... Yeah, the, the Nginx example I just gave, I committed to the open surf repo as an example. There's a bug uh, awesome. for that. It's called um, open surf could use a mitigation for DDoS. Um, oh, okay. I think I've seen that bug. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I threw that just just an example config for nginx, um, which just I just basically read through the nginx documentation and then applied it to OpenSurf. Um, nice. Well, we'll have to take a look at that too. Nice. Any other show and tell? Could maybe a super poor man's version of that be rather than to uh, blow away um, the entire brick and push out a new one to um, just drop the services for a moment and then bring them back? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, in some single server scenarios, we don't delete it because it's, so it's just the one server. <clears throat> so you know, there's an Ansible script that'll restart all the services. So what I, what in those cases, I've got a, a minute, every minute cron that does a, a clever curl against itself and it checks for a 200 okay from the evergreen OPAC basically. And that's how, that's basically how I'm checking whether the brick is up or down is a, it's a curl command against its own URL and then does some gripping and stuff and <clears throat> checks to see for a 200 okay. And if it doesn't get a 200 OK, it'll fall into a if clause. It's just a bash script. And then it'll execute an Ansible playbook that will stop all the services, kill eJabberD, restart eJabberD, memcached, start um, Apache and WebSockets and Nginx. That whole thing takes about 30 seconds. So in a real worst case scenario, they actually would be down for 30 seconds. but and I and I've watched this behavior in in the wild, and most people don't even notice. Um, and single single server setups like that, where you load a page, you know. And we only have single server setups for small uh, libraries, and you know that 
can't afford the big honking server, so they just got the one server. And um, it works pretty good in terms of nobody really realizing, but it'll it'll do it, and I'll, I'll get a report like, oh, it rebooted twice yesterday, ran out of resources or whatever, and then that Ansible script kicked in and restarted Evergreen. Evergreen just loves to die sometimes if you you know um, under certain unknown conditions, a single brick or a single instance can get overwhelmed for different reasons, and I've just come to just just uh take that as a given and just plan for it and you know restart services accordingly automatically um yeah i can share the playbooks i think i've got them out there somewhere and this this document is editable editable publicly if you can't do that let me know but it should you should be able to add stuff um we had a question from Ryan um, about what everybody's doing for tracking packages. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, patches, uh, tweaks, customizations between upgrades. Um, how are we applying them? How are we um, doing that? And Jessica is, has seconded the motion. Um, so I can speak to what Pines is currently doing. We have a um, what we typically do is have a Git repo ourselves um, based on a specific version. So I'll pull down, you know, 3.8 or whatever and take the customizations we had on the previous version, which in our case was 3.6, and um, try it. And I'll do a big um, re interactive rebase and we'll pull it all in and deal with all the conflicts, which, you know, that can get pretty hairy. Um, so it's definitely something that, uh, you know, cause, cause sometimes you're dealing with fixes for code that no longer needs to be fixed, et cetera. So, you know, you want the people on your staff involved as much as possible. So I'll have, you know, Taryn does a lot of um, updates to the OPAC and, I often have to sort of consult with her about whether a particular fix is still necessary. Um, I can see Jason, Jason's got a lot of ideas about this and, I, and he and I have gone back and forth between um, keeping customizations in a separate branch versus uh, the main branch. But I've, I've tended to just, everybody gets their habits. My habit is to pull down the sort of 3.8.0 version and then just start piling everything on top of that. Um, but from there, uh, as far as building what we do, um, for a long time, we would take the tarball and then smush our customization, our customized files on top of that. But because that doesn't work well with the Angular stuff, um, I have it now taken to um, building from Git all of like, so build the Git repo the, just the way I want it and then build directly from there is a lot more um, a lot easier as y'all know who um, any anybody who knows how pines has worked for the last 10 years or so we we have a custom build script uh, system called Genesis and uh, we want to put more ansible in that you know maybe augment or replace that with Ansible. But at the moment, we're still using that, but now we're building it from Git, uh, which is which is a, a be much better approach than trying to put everything on top of uh, a tarball. So for what it's worth, that's what Pines is doing right now. And Jason says he's on his phone. He's He's uh, suggesting rebasing more often than what I'm doing, which is kind of once a year. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that in incremental rebases are better than what I'm doing. Anybody else want to share what they're doing or have questions about others' processes? I'm going to type, so I'm going to mute myself.
Okay, so J. Um, okay, so Bill's doing what I'm doing. It sounds like, and Jason is saying more or less the same thing. So that those are kind of. Uh, it looks like that that might be a consensus from three, you know, pretty sizable consortia or uh, library systems anyway. Um, Ryan, did you want to share anything for yourself or did you have particular questions or Jessica? Um, do we mirror the community repo locally? Uh, we do not. Um, we push, we actually have a, a sub repo in the community on, on the community Git server that we push everything into. Um, so there's a contrib uh, pines, I think is where we, no, it's, it's evergreen. Evergreen pines.git is where, where ours lives. And I'd be happy outside of this session to work with you, Jessica, if you're interested. We also have a GitLab server, but we aren't using it for evergreen development because last I looked, the free version does not allow the sort of mirroring I want it to. And Ryan is saying that his, um, his questions are basically answered. So the other thing about Angular that I do um, is if it's sort of a hot patch situation where you're not going to like rebuild the whole server, I will um, I will apply the change to Git and then rebuild um, Angular on the actual production server, and then I'll build it on sort of the first application server, and then copy it over copy over the resulting files to all the rest of the servers. Rsync basically everything over um, after that's built, and that works pretty well. Others may have different opinions on that too. It's sort of the hot patch approach. I have a slightly different take on it. The um, uh, so it's an Ansible script that we do all the deployments with, and um, so you can tell it to do things in parallel, of course. So I'll say, you know, run out to all the bricks right now, do the Angular build, or you know, do the Git pull. All right, now do the Angular build. Now do the Angular deploy. Um, and since they're all pulled from the same repo, the compiled files have the same you know, checksums and everything. So that, that it's essentially what you're doing, Chris, just from a different perspective. Nice. And those are the only files, like if you're patching Angular JS, you can just put them in place uh, and then hope that somebody reloads their page someday. <laughs> um, but, uh, Copies of the repository on prod servers and use CSSH. That's not something I'm familiar with. Is that one of those multi-terminal things where you type once and it runs the same command on a bunch of different yeah. servers? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Oh, okay. Then I then I do I do similar things too. It's hard hard not to feel powerful when you are. <laughs> typing into one window that's affected. They're scary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and Ansible is even more so, I think. I like not scary, but like that's a lot of power. You just hit, hit a button and it goes and does stuff. And it tells you it's doing it and you have to trust it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mistake multipliers. Yeah. You always have to feel. Yeah. Exactly. Hollywood hackers. Uh, you, you always have to feel. Um, you always have to be careful about whether when you do like a, you know, restart all these bricks, you're not like also logged into the web server for your agency or something like that. That's that's happened a lot before without you realizing what you just did. I have an unrelated sysadmin question, uh, two-parter. Who all is using Postgres 10 or above? I know Chris is. And uh, anyone here using PG Bouncer? We are not using PG Bouncer. Um, we have uh, considered it in the past, but I guess it would be good for those weird queries where somebody's trying to 
inject stuff that sometimes want to bring us down, that would probably be a good a good use case for that. Um, well, my, my use case was essentially just a, a replacement for PG pool. Um, since we're not, we don't really do, we don't actually uh, do the, you know, where you send queries to the right and the, and the replica, it's all coming from the same database. So we don't really need the uh, pooling and the spreading out. Um, so the bounce PG bouncer would just be a, you know, just for the uh, connection pooling to take some of the load off Postgres directly. That makes sense. Um, we haven't used PG pool in a long time. Like we, we, oh, okay. we just have everything running through the master server. Directly connecting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, until that becomes a problem, I'm not sure. I mean, PG bouncer is a good idea because it, it, it is the, the bouncer function, you know, it's like it, it keeps the bad guys out. Right. So, um, um, that's, you know, I, it's not an aspect of it. I've really given much thought to, honestly, okay. I've only really been looking at the, uh, the, the connection pooling mechanism. Yeah. Um, and one thing that's important for me is, uh, having something that can force Postgres to pre fork a certain amount. Um, so that as load spikes out of nowhere, it doesn't uh, cause like a fork storm on the Postgres server in, in real time, mm -hmm. um, which has been something we've had to deal with in the past. So this kind of solves that. And PG pool also solves that too. I may have to reevaluate that. I haven't looked at it in a really long time. Like the, the idea of connection pooling. I mean, I, I'm fine with it. And we have a server that's literally like the backup server. That's all it does. It just sits there and receives logs and is ready to come in if the master server yeah. goes down. Yeah. Um, and then we have a report server uh, aside from that. So we have three copies of the DB running at all times. Okay, I should take some notes. So we, I see at least two PG-10 users. No one's using anything beyond that in production, I'm assuming. So Ryan says he's investigated similar um, solutions to what Bill is looking at as well. Okay, I saw Jessica unmute a second ago. Did you have something to add or did you have a question? No, I just reconnected. <laughs> oh, no, no problem. And it, and it auto unmuted me. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Got to be careful of that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there work being done on better cache busting or do some have custom solutions for those angular the template changes like so i'm as i mentioned a minute ago about you know hoping that somebody someday refreshes their browser windows so that the changes that you've worked so hard to get in there actually work um i i've seen that brought up fairly recently in irc as sort of a question but i, I don't remember i think jason stevenson had something to say about it um, but I, I, I don't remember, and we have not looked. Oh, I guess we did that too, J Jason. We, we disabled the cache settings, as I think you recommended. That's what I'm remembering. Um, For the Angular stuff specifically, um, you, you do need a, a very low or no cache on the index.html file. Um, but you can leave a very long cache on the, the build files that have the cache busting key in them 
Um, so which is 99% of the actual application because uh, it'll be tied to a specific build. Um, so that's kind of what we have is the index has a, maybe like a five minute cache timeout and everything else has a, like a 30 day cache. That seems to work pretty well. Because if you're timing out the index, it'll always fetch the latest or it'll always know that it needs to fetch the latest build files. And then if those are cached, you won't have to actually grab them. Yeah, that's good. Um, Jason says, Jason Boyer says, um, there were some changes made to the stock, e.g. .conf, that's the Apache file for those who aren't that familiar. The drop the cache on the Apache direct, on the Angular directories, it also relied on the headers module, which has not historically been enabled. Those are good things to know. I um, also decided a while back to put the Angular file grabbing definitions into the Nginx config so that that entire branch of the web server never even touches Apache. Um, it's just using the Nginx static file delivery and the caching that you can configure in there. So my thinking was it might take some load off Apache if it's just serving static files anyway. Um, and I can share that config if anyone's interested. Yeah, I was going to ask. Does yeah, the, I'm interested too. Does the stock config have a specific line in the Apache for the index file? Yeah, there's there's just a couple of lines in Apache for the um, Angular index because it has to be. There's just this little bit of logic that has to be baked into it so that it knows to fall back to the index file when you fetch a different file. Um, maybe, I, maybe I'm looking at an outdated version of eg.conf. Let me see here. Yeah, I guess um, version 3.0 is a little bit dated. <laughs> Oh, okay, thanks for that correction. Put a link to the relevant Nginx config bits. Thanks, Bill. That's helpful. Um, all right. Have I missed any chat questions? No. I mean, I will say just in general, we're doing pretty well, especially after applying the um, open ILS actor flooding patches, the um, the, the, the launch pad tag for those is uh, parallel requests. So if that's not something you've applied to your system and you're getting you know overwhelmed and people complaining about slow stuff, you may investigate those. Um, there's still something out there that's occasionally flooding those for us and I, I haven't quite nailed it down, um, but I am seeing it's just far less often, <laughs> which is really nice. But given that this is, you know, peak time, um, this is, you know, despite rising COVID cases, it, you know, people are going out to libraries, libraries are open. You know, we're seeing a lot of activity. It's definitely far busier on the server side than normal for us uh, over the last couple of years. Um, 
and things are pretty happy for us. We're, we're doing all right. Um, so what I mean to say is that I think a lot of the server side stuff that used to plague us, I think a lot of it has been resolved over time. Like, I think we're at a much more mature place as a project than we've been in a, uh, since, since I've started. My 14 year anniversary is Thursday from when I started my job at GPLS. So I've been here a while. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. 14 years, man. Wow. 14 years. I felt like you were um, uh, kind of the old guard. Is that when I first started? And can you believe I first started 10 years ago? <laughs> wow. No kidding. <laughs> wow. That, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what, see, that's like when I was trying to think of the number of conferences we've had, it's like, this is like number 13, right? I mean, we've had a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah. In 10, 10 years, especially the pandemic in play, 10 years seems, 10 years ago seems a lot more recent than it would have. Right. Th thanks, everybody. I, I wasn't fishing for applause or compliments. I was <laughs> mentioning that my, uh, my anniversary is here. Uh, hey, oh, I'm looking for. Goodness. I'm, looking for uh, yeah. uh, I'm feeling old all of a sudden. I've, I've been at APL since 98. Oh, there you go. Uh, anniversaries. <laughs> yeah. Not this, not on Evergreen the whole time, obviously. Chris, I was looking for that parallel bug. I've seen it and I've read it. I can't seem to find it. Is it closed now? Oh, there are a number of them that um, some of them may be fixed released already. Um, oh, um, Ryan, Ryan beat me to it. Uh, so uh, no, I'll thanks, throw Ryan. that over here. Let's see. Let me drag that window over here. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we've got a few here. Uh, so, you know, essentially these are all Angular JS files that are doing sequential calls, which means that if you, for instance, load a, if you have the catalog, it's a lot of it's cataloger stuff. If you load a, a patron bucket, or I mean, a, a, an item bucket, for instance, uh, the act of loading in the, you know, 250 items in that bucket can result in 250 separate calls and that, using the batch methods that are listed in these fixes um, is, is resolving the issue. And it is, it's very formulaic. Yes, patron buckets are affected. Um, loading the item status screen with a hold like a file, that's also affected. Um, and so these, these are things that when we, um, when we have applied these fixes, it actually calms things down a lot. Um, and it's almost like for these ones that haven't been fixed yet, it's almost copy paste across for the fix. Uh, if, if you if you understand enough about JS, um, and I, I get my eyes start crossing when I look through this stuff a lot um, to know exactly where we are in the tree of if thens. Um, but uh, this these fixes are implementable and i think i don't know um several people have con contributed these fixes and they've helped a lot so performance though seems a lot better than it used to be yeah. coming up on 15 minutes just to let you know oh okay thank you I wanted to say that I noticed the performance going down in Evergreen when the ever when the staff client, the web-based staff client, became more prevalent. Evergreen was was less solid than it was, and so there was a period I think during the Zool client days that it was actually pretty darn good in terms of stability and in terms of seeing bricks dying all the time and all these these things that we're seeing now, sort of got destabilized with the web-based staff client quite a bit and a lot more cpu resource hog evergreen was yeah. wanting to slurp up all the memory and cpu a lot 
more than before. So when we upgraded from 2.12 to 3.0 or 3.1 and 3.2, things changed dramatically. We had to change the specs of our bricks and things like that. Um, and so, like you said, it's just finally started, I think, maybe getting back to where we were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're exactly right. That, that had the same effect for us. Um, you know, we, we've always been on super beefy hardware and it was really stretching uh, some stuff when, when we first went to the web client, like you said. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're just, we've got, we've got enough developers right now who have zeroed in on this as an issue that it's helped us tremendously. Jason Stevenson is making the point that Zool used more batch operation and the Angular JS uses pcrud uh, more often. And the, it's, it is those pcrud calls that are doing that. Yeah, I think those so are the core. Yeah, those are the core um, reasons right there. Yeah, WebSockets is a right. free for all. Right, right. Web, WebSockets itself is not doing any limiting. Yeah, let's bring back Zool. Let's do it. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll build a test client this afternoon based on Zool version 12 or something. Yeah, it was there till 3.2. Mm -hmm. um, actually, just this last week, I went through the exercise of changing our Docker build, the ones on GitHub for everybody, and I should probably put it in this document, um, so that you can build Evergreen all the way back to like 2.11 with a couple of switches and a config file. Uh, I couldn't get it to actually complete on 2.11 or 2.12, but it came pretty close. It was all the node stuff that broke it, but I'll put it out there. Thank you. All right, just gonna copy and paste this uh, bug link into the doc so we know where we were. Oops. Sometimes control A does not do what you think it will. Okay. Is there a better alternative to web sockets? <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> Bill, Bill is the one who did <clears throat> the investigation into that several years ago. There he is. Yeah, so it's a good tool. We just need to use it right, probably. We could put limiting code in the, in the uh, WebSocket translator if we wanted to do that. Yeah. The um, certainly all of the uh, cert code and other Angular code that I'm kind of have going on in Launchpad now is very much uh, aware of this problem, um, and a lot of it we're already running in production at King County. So um, I can say with high level of confidence that uh, it's not at least the way we're using it. It's not popping up. Um, basically, every every Angular component. We'll have like a load function and it'll just do one thing, load the next thing, load the next thing, load the next thing. And it's very, it's very, it goes out of its way to make sure nothing's overly parallelized. Awesome. There's a lull, so I'll throw this in from left field. Um, more evergreen admin than system admin. Um, the folks that did the uh, holds presentation last year, uh, the entire process of how the rules evaluate and everything, that was amazing. I have sent that to so many staff as a means to, okay, 
rather than me attempt to explain this to you, here, watch this. Um, um, can we um, convince anybody to do something similar for the whole um, circulation rules? Yeah, well, not this year, probably. <laughs> but, I yeah. volunteer, Chris Sharp. Uh, <laughs> I, I can do the, the one of the tricks of circles um, is that they are very different per organization. So um, we are at Pines, we have a single standard for how CERC works across all the libraries. And every time a library is like, well, we want to work, we want it to work different, we shut them down and we say, nope. And that is the key to my happiness as a sysadmin when I'm dealing with CERC stuff. Uh, and it's, I think, also a key to peace out in the field. Um, and uh, yeah, Jason is mentioning that, that Ben Chum and he did, did one years ago. I'm thinking Hood River, maybe that was the one on Git on Building Master. But anyway, but we did, um, Jason and uh, I guess it was Tom Berzanski are the ones who did a lot of work on the way CERC works now. Um, it is very complex. It is very annoying. Um, boy, that was a long time ago, Grand Rapids. Um, and, you know, managing the rules, testing the rules, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I, I feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> If only there was such a thing as everybody does everything exactly the same here. We're not really a consortium. We're a consort of yeah. multiple folks sharing an ILS all with their own loan periods, own rate, fine rates, own their own organization of location. Everything's different. So when yeah. somebody wants a CERC rule change, it gets interesting yeah yeah because it, it's yeah you're building a, a big jenga tower and if you tinker with one of the the lower down bricks it's gonna fall yeah that that is that is i, I don't envy you on that that is exactly why we stop it um that's why we hold rules are even like the actual hold policies that tell you if you're allowed the hold um those are even less flexible than CERC. Uh, with, the CERC. with the flexibility that CERC brings, that's why it's so complex. But with holds, it's like it either matches or it doesn't match. And if you need it to match you, on something, you've got to create a rule across all your agencies or something like that. And it's just, that's bad. Then you have like, you know, 10,000 CERC rules or something. Um, so, and, and like, you know, very fragile. So if somebody wants to crank up their video recording software and make a video to po post on the Evergreen YouTube channel explaining all that, it sounds like we've got some takers for uh, audience. Mostly just try to encapsulate every bit of the logic. So. I don't have to spend so much time in testing. Does it do this or does it do that? Yeah, I we're we're so incremental in the way we change things that that you know using the test functions in the database that that's that's how we have to do it, um, and it is it is very very complex. I think if we had to design it from scratch now, that would be bad. All right, any final questions, final thoughts, anything? Let's see, Michelle's saying, oh, they, they base circulation rules on library, circ modifiers, and shelving locations when necessary. So yes, we do occasionally get little tweaks to that that we let slip in, but mostly we're very fascist about our rules. We do not want them changing ever. So. Um, 
All right. Well, um, yes, understanding the flags, the weights, inheritance, all of that is very challenging. Yes, the fall through thing, that, that's, that's awesome, but it's also really complex. Um, and then owning library item circle. Yeah, that's, I think ours actually, we, we, that's the other thing. Actually, Jeremy's making a great point is that our circles are based on where the circ happens as opposed to who, who owns the circ. Uh, we don't really care who, because we're a sharing consortium, we don't really care who, which particular library owns it. The circ policy policies have to be based on the library where the patron's checking them out. Otherwise, you have one patron who's checking out 15 things with 15 different circles, which would be extremely confusing. So, um, and that, by the way, th that veers into consortium management issues that are outside of our normal purview as tech people. But I think as far as like, if you were to design, like a lot of people got excited about Evergreen when it came out and we're like, oh, we'll do what Georgia's doing without realizing that we, our consortium had already done the hard work of negotiating a shared set of rules and all of that and all sort of coming to agreement. And, you know, anybody who's worked with libraries for any length of time understands that uh, getting even three or four library directors, much less 50 library directors to agree on any one thing can be very, very difficult. So having a, but having a certain, you know, shared set of rules, expectations, um, our, our catchphrase is shared patron experience. Um, and if that is broken, then you're, as a sysadmin, it's basically impossible to implement everybody's little tweaks. So, all right, well, I'm gonna just uh, let the last few minutes uh, dribble on unless there are other questions in these uh, right now. Yeah, you, Steve, Steven is, is make, Steve is making a, a point in, in jest, but it's also true that you can over legislate <laughs> and make it so too many people are making too many decisions that need to just be made. So yeah, you do have to find a balance between uh, that kind of uh, committee you know, you can't administer a system by committee. It has to be like a person. So, all right. Thanks all for coming and joining me today. And um, we look forward to seeing you for the rest of the conference. Bye all. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. All right, we have a half hour break, it looks like, before lightning talks uh, start up at 3 until 3.30. If you want to sign up for lightning talks, I think there's still a few slots available. Uh, feel free to do so if you go to the event chat. I have the link up. Uh, then after that, we're going to resume. Uh, track one has two half hour sessions with going fine free and an introduction to user experience. Then in this track and track two, 330 is the ACK interest group.